TV went from black and white TV to color TV. Uh, somebody should do something about sound uh, for communications. So the idea was uh, what would be the equivalent of color in TV uh, to the sound. Uh, so together with Professor Wolf, uh, he uh, submitted a patent to the patent office, uh, drafted something uh, that he his invention is the idea to transmit music over phone lines, over ISDN. And the patent examiner told him, no, no, state of the art is this is not possible. <laughs> and Professor Seitzer um, said, of course it is possible. <laughs> so he asked me uh, to fill that position and to find out uh, what quality can be achieved at what bit rates and whether it's possible to do transmit uh, music, high quality audio over ISDN lines. I have to admit at that time I myself uh, didn't believe that was possible. I knew too much about the difficulties. There was the idea around already to use transform coding that was very high complexity for that time for speech coding. There was already clearly the idea around to use psychoacoustics to apply that to uh, concentrate uh, on using uh, the capabilities, the limited capabilities of the human ear of masking uh, to reduce the bit rate. At some point in early 86, uh, I had to do an intermediate progress report on, for some funding for some research project. Uh, so I did think uh, through all the uh, ways we had, what we had tried up to then, what possibilities there are. And a couple of weeks later, uh, suddenly occurred, oh, you could perhaps do things differently. Uh, not straightforward as it usual at that time with bit allocation alg algorithms and uh, doing quantizing, but the other way around. Similar to what was already common in speech coding at that point, uh, analysis by synthesis techniques and the ideas how to apply analysis by synthesis techniques in a completely different way uh, as it was used in speech coding, but the same basic ideas of trying things until they converge to find the optimum result to music coding. And uh, I thought, okay, the combination of this with uh, entropy coding, Huffman coding could perhaps work. I had one week of really late night work to try out whether this uh, idea could actually give some results. And after that one week, uh, I had a very preliminary setup of everything, including training Huffman tables uh, and doing actual coding uh, and got the first music out of it. And uh, it didn't sound too bad, so I wrote a short memo uh, to Professor Seitzer saying, okay, I think there's a new algorithm in the race for high quality audio coding. And in the end, this basic idea is what's still used in MP3, AAC, and a lot of other modern audio codecs. For the AES convention in Paris in 88, uh, we did some experiments with 64 kilobits per second per channel coding, 128 total, uh, which at that time still looked like a dream. And it sounded not too bad, I remember we uh, I let run it uh, over some piano piece and uh, <laughs> sounded a little bit like a drunken piano player. <laughs> so clearly lots of artifacts, but it was the first coding at that bit rate. There were a number of big sampling yeah. blocks. Uh, first, uh, compared to what had been done earlier, uh, the idea of uh, not doing bit allocation first uh, and then trying to quantize with that bit allocation but doing it the other way around by quantizing uh, and then using Huffman coding to get the bit rate and using buffer control to keep that controlled. Uh, that was a major progress over earlier adaptive transform coding schemes. Gave a lot of coding efficiency and in fact uh, earlier classic ATC always had some probability of quantizer overload. 
and that couldn't happen anymore uh, with this technique. Uh, so uh, this means uh, one major source of distortion was completely eliminated. So that was one. To get that running, the buffer control, which we call bit reservoir, uh, or in fact bit sparkasse, bit savings account in the first internal uh, code, uh, that was invented for this purpose. Um, then the so-called outer iteration loop or distortion control loop using uh, analysis by synthesis uh, to step by step adjusting quantizer step sizes uh, in a way uh, that it should be below the mass threshold uh, for every critical band. Uh, that was the uh, next stumbling block uh, and then to get uh, overall bitrate down the uh, time domain alias and cancellation method with the MTCT uh, that made quite some step forward. But that was all the early work and there was still lots of things to do. And in fact, in 88, uh, MPEG started its work, the Moving Pictures Experts Group. And after first working on video compression only, they found out they would need some audio compression. <laughs> uh, so uh, just uh, pictures without sound were no longer fashionable. <laughs> In late 91, there was already a decision by MPEG to have layer one and layer two. And there was still the question whether the layer three system was of enough quality. In fact, in some test in Early uh, 91, it uh, didn't work that well, so we redid some basic ideas of the system, changed it quite a bit. Two days before the final test started, uh, we found a severe bug in the compiler used for the digital signal processor, uh, which really made part of the data going to the next signal processor in the processing chain random data. And that were, in fact, data controlling uh, the quantization the output from the psychoacoustic model, in part, was random data. <laughs> Once we found that bug, it was easy to uh, find a workaround. Uh, and once that was implemented, uh, from one half hour to the next one, it sounded so much better at low bit rates. It was like, yes, we've done it finally. <laughs> And we went uh, into the test, and I still remember Gerhard Stoll, who was main architect for the Musicam Layer 2 system, listening to this and saying, no, something with the bitrate must be wrong. This can't be so good. <laughs>